Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Harvard Humanitarian Initiatives Careers in Humanitarianism webinar for the month of February. We're thrilled to have you with us today and we have a great panel of team members from HHI who are going to tell you more about their careers in the humanitarian field. And to start this webinar off, I will pass it to Dr. Valentino, Director of Program on Resilient Communities and the National NGO Program on Humanitarian Leadership to introduce our panel. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Um, again, my name is Enzo Bolatino. I direct a program on resilient communities here at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. It's really a pleasure to uh, be here with you today and to be able to introduce uh, two of my very best, uh, wonderful colleagues in the Philippines. Um, just a little bit about um, our program. Uh, we started up in 2015, um, looking at um, how we could bring research and develop the evidence base around what people are actually doing to prepare for disasters in the Philippines. Uh, as many of you know, will know, the Philippines is one of the most um, vulnerable uh, countries in the world to the impacts of climate change and uh, disasters. Uh, sitting in the Pacific Rim of Fire, it's uh, enormously impacted by typhoons and flooding. And so what we've tried to do is really bring research uh, to bear to be able to understand how people uh, deal with, uh, cope with, and experience disasters. Uh, and to utilize that information to be able to uh, improve practice and raise awareness. Um, and we could not do the work uh, that we do without really um, amazing staff on the ground. And so uh, it's absolutely a pleasure for me to be able to introduce to you um, two of my colleagues, uh, Ms. Leah Manzanero and Mr. Mark Toldo. Uh, Leah is our project lead in the Philippines and Mark, our communications uh, director. Um, both have uh, really elevated um, our ability to do research, uh, expand our networks, and really uh, elevate people's voices uh, within the Philippines and bring and raise awareness around what's being done uh, to prepare for disasters and increase resilience um, across the country. So I'll turn it now over to my, uh, my wonderful colleagues uh, and looking forward to hearing about their uh, perspectives on their own careers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Enzo, for that great introduction. Um, before we begin, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about the logistics of today's event, um, and then our panelists will begin talking about their careers. Today's presentation will be conducted in English, and it will be done for about an hour, the first half being dedicated to our panelists, telling you each a little bit more about their careers. And then after that, the second half of the event will be dedicated to an audience Q&A session. I'd like to invite all of our attendees today to submit your questions for our panelists through the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen um, and simply click that button and submit your questions and we will do our best to get through as many questions as we can. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Mark for his presentation. Thank you so much, Sabrina and Enzo. Uh, so let me share my screen first. Uh, I hope you can see it. So uh, good day, everyone, wherever you are in the world right now. Thank you for joining us in today's webinar. Before I begin, I would like to express my gratitude to our leaders here at HHI for their enormous support and guidance for me throughout my journey here at Harvard. Our directors, Dr. Irini Albanti and Dr. Michael Van Ruyen, HHI Resilient Communities Program Director, Dr. Vincenzo Bolitino, and Program Manager, Ariana Marisho. And thank you as well to Sabrina Sarli, who is at the helm of this webinar. So I am Mark Toldo, a Filipino who since uh, 2019 has been leading the communications of HHI Resilient Communities, one of the research programs of HHI. We at the HHI Resilient Communities Program are engaged in activities designed to better understand the factors that contribute to community resilience to disasters, climate change, and the COVID-19 pandemic in Asia, particularly in the Philippines, Bangladesh, and soon in Nepal. Most of our work involves research, awareness raising, and training activities for communities vulnerable to the impacts of natural hazards. Overall, my work in leading the communications of the program involves building and maintaining harmonious relationships with journalists and media organizations, as well as the general public in the countries where we work at. I serve as media producer, researcher, writer, photographer, videographer, and editor for contents about our work. 
Of course, writing is very essential part of my role. I write blogs, press releases, social media posts, emails, and other correspondence with our stakeholders. For events hosted by our program or where our program is invited to participate or present, I make sure that the messages that we wanted to convey are presented in the best way possible. A huge responsibility of mine is also to anticipate any potential communications crisis, such as misinformation, disinformation, and miscommunication that could harm our programming, and most especially the work and impact that we have on the sectors and populations that we serve. When any crisis arises, a communications specialist should be able to immediately address it, but prevention is always better than cure in terms of crisis communications. In addition to these responsibilities as research report to our researchers, before the onset of the pandemic, we have been conducting field work in the Philippines for research projects where I support data gathering, documentation of field visits in communities, focus group discussions, interviews, and meeting with partners on the ground. But of course, due to the pandemic, we had to pivot to conducting our projects online, which I have been actively involved, especially in formulating strategies on how to do research in the new normal. So I think it would be clear to understand my work by not just telling, but showing some of the outputs or accomplishments that we have achieved through communications. Uh, through active dissemination of our study results, we have been featured in at least 100 news media stories, uh, both on local and international media. One of the most notable features were about the national or the nationwide household disaster preparedness survey in the Philippines that we conducted in 2017, where a lot of data were revealed about the state of disaster preparedness and resilience of Filipinos at the household, local, and national levels. These results were instrumental not only to the public's understanding of disaster preparedness and resilience, but also critical to the programming of resilience actors like the government, NGOs, humanitarians, media and researchers. These stories were published in print, television, and online. These do not include those broadcast via radio as they were hard to monitor for us. So uh, these are just some of the articles that were published by the media and reached millions of people in total. With my background in documentary production, we were able to produce simple video series chronicling our work in the Philippines and Bangladesh. In these videos, we provided a clearer and better understanding of who we are as a program and what exactly are we doing and why our work is important, both to humanitarians, researchers, and the vulnerable populations themselves. Although videos are a very powerful tool in communicating our work and engaging a lot of audiences, uh, articles such as blogs are also significant, especially when they are written by the, by the researchers themselves. Uh, here are some of the blogs that my colleagues and I, and I have recently created. Many of them involve our views supported by our research and experience in the field. We turn data and information from our publications and reports into infographics that we share to a broader audience, especially online, both in English and the local language. Publications and data can be very complex, so the role of the communication specialist is to pick the data and information that are most valuable and relevant to the stakeholders and the goal of the research. These data must be translated and formatted in a way that can be easily understood by as many people as possible. I strongly believe that even if your organization's primary stakeholders do not involve the general public, the public must always be one of the target audiences for communicating your work, especially data and information. Although this can be achieved through the media, if your organization can do it too, please do so. Uh, let us contribute to the knowledge of the general public, especially the, the, the vulnerable and marginalized on socioeconomic issues, because information alone can be a very potent tool in empowering people and changing their lives for the better. Here are just uh, a few examples of how we format our reports. And some of the events where our researchers presented our work including my colleague Lea Bansanera and I's last presentation in person at Harvard in 2019. Our most recent uh, event was the Surviving COVID-19 on the Margins online symposium, 
where nine chosen papers were presented highlighting the impacts of the pandemic on vulnerable populations in the Philippines. In the past, where we were working under the original project name Disaster Net, we noticed a lot of confusion from our stakeholders about our program and our work. So we decided to rebrand our program into HHI Resilient Communities and became more active online, especially on social media. I would like to take to encourage all of you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter by scanning the QR codes on your screens right now. Um, and upon rebranding, we have observed more brand recall from our stakeholders. They had a clear understanding of our work and received more engagements online and expressions of interest and support for our program. Lastly, we have grown our close networks of stakeholders to at least 700 locally and globally. As to my career journey, I earned my bachelor's degree in communication arts in 2013 and started working in a TV network as a program researcher for a multi-awarded multi program in the same year. I moved to a big newspaper as editorial assistant and eventually a cub reporter where I founded the police and local government beat. I then moved to back to TV and another huge media network where, where I produced, wrote, researched, and edited documentaries and specials, both on TV and digital platforms. While working as a documentarist, I started my uh, graduate study in journalism, but due to my erratic work schedule, I had to put off my graduate study. Before moving to HHI, I, I had a quick stint in a government agency where I and other young professionals established the first strategic communications department of this government agency that has been long serving a huge sector without official communications work. Apart from my full-time work at HHI, I still do freelance journalism and writing. And just recently, I have started providing freelance strategic communication service for NGOs and groups in Asia working on climate solutions. I am extremely grateful to HHI for the enormous support and flexibility that the organization has been giving me, which allows me to pursue my many passions and provide more impact in my own little ways in our society. So how did I get here? It's simply through job hopping. I was once told by one of my former boss that I should stop job hopping because it is detrimental to my career. He was actually right. In fact, until now, job hopping is still regarded as a negative quality of an applicant by some companies. But why do many of us, especially in developing countries, hop from one job to another in short periods of time? Unfair labor practices, being overworked yet underpaid, lack of professional growth, poor leadership, discrimination based on gender and disabilities. Generally, these are just some of the main, many painful realities that many workers suffer, especially in a developing country. This is why when we are given an opportunity to be in a better working environment, some of us take that big leap even over and over again. So yes, I was job hopping, but what I did was make sure that whenever I take that leap, I think I take something with me. It can be knowledge, skills, resources, good allies and friends, networks, and a variety of experience. I'm not encouraging people to job hop, but if you are in su such a situation, I wanted to tell you that in the end, you can turn this all around and make your job hopping journey an advantage to where you are headed. In terms of education, I have not continued my graduate studies yet, yet due to many reasons such as lack of funding. I am definitely interested in pursuing a graduate degree in other fields like public health and humanitarian related fields. However, some scholarships don't even allow you to work while studying, which won't work for me. Uh, because I have a lot of bills to pay and that's a reality, especially as someone living with disabilities. For sure, many people can relate to my situation. Uh, let me share what I have been doing about it. While future studies remain uncertain for me, I somehow try to fill in the gaps through applying and participating in free, short education and training opportunities offered by reputable institutions. Even here at HHI and Harvard, 
there are free education and training opportunities that are available. So if you're confronted with the same struggles as mine, I encourage you to do the same. If you are interested in delving into communications work, here are the qualities that I think you must have or at least start building or gaining. It would be a huge advantage if you have an experience working in journalism, media, public relations, or advertising. A graduate degree is definitely an edge, especially if you're applying for a job in the government. But in the end, your skills and professionalism would matter more than your degree. Finally, excellent verbal communication skills can be very beneficial to you and the organization, especially if your work requires a spokesperson. For my final point today, here are the themes that emerged as I was reflecting on my career journey. My work both in journalism and communications revolves around these topics. And it made me realize that my passion in telling stories and contributing to solutions about these topics stems from my firsthand experience growing up of poverty, inadequate access to basic needs and services such as food, healthcare, lack of access to correct information on health, environment, financing, science, and the traumatic impacts of routine disasters. All of these are what, I'll, what I call my who got. Allow me to introduce to you this popular Filipino word, hugot, which means to draw or to pull something out. In this case, emotions. In the music industry, when I think of hugot, I think of Adele, who just exudes so much emotions whenever she sings. Wherever she's drawing out these emotions, her passion, it's her hugot. So whenever you are confused or uncertain about your career, maybe try reflecting and delving into your passions and where they are coming from. You may not have a firsthand experience of the problem that you're trying to alleviate through your work, but you may discover something, a reason why you are passionate about it, your who good. And when you do so, everything will make sense and your who good may determine either why you are in the right place or why you should move on and pursue what you truly desire. Again, I am Mark Toldo. Please feel free to connect with me through email, Twitter, or LinkedIn. You may scan the QR code on your screen to quickly get my contact information. It's been a pleasure presenting before you all today. Please stay for the next presentation by my colleague, Leo Mancinero. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Leia. Slides. Can you see my slides okay? Yes. All right, so warm greetings from the Philippines. Thank you, Mark, for capturing in your presentation what we do here in the Philippines. And thank you for the organizers of this event, especially Sabrina. Thank you to our director, Enzo, for the kind words during the introduction earlier. I am Leia Manzanero, and I work at the Resilient Communities Program at, the, at HHI. So for context, as, me, as Enzo mentioned earlier, the Philippines is located in the Pacific Wing of Fire with active volcanoes and frequent earthquakes. The Philippines is an archipelago with the Pacific Ocean located on the east side, generating about 20 to 25 typhoons per year. We are so used to experiencing typhoons. I was even born during Typhoon Ilang, and my name was derived from it. The Philippines is also one of the 17 megadiverse countries containing two thirds of Earth's biodiversity and 70% of the world's plants and animal species. It also ranks as the fifth country with the most mineral resources with the third largest gold deposits. Unfortunately, this makes our country um, one of the world's biodiversity hotspots with at least 700 threatened species. Based on the nationwide household survey that we conducted, Filipinos' perceptions of climate change at the national level is low, with only 11.7% of respondents 
having heard a lot or felt extremely well informed about climate change. Only 27% of the population was confident that they could adapt to changes resulting from a disaster. It is against this backdrop that, is, that I start my presentation on having a career in research and capacity building for resilience. As, as Enzo mentioned earlier, the program on resilient communities of HHI started as disaster net project in the Philippines in 2017. I joined in April 2018 and now approaching my fourth year in the project. Sorry. Um, as a project lead, here are my tasks at HHI. Sorry, something's wrong with my slide. Um, so as a project lead, I help conduct and manage researches such as the network analysis of actors involved in disaster risk reduction and management. And I'm sorry, Sabrina, can you please help me with the slide? Yes, um, I will um, put the slide up on my end. I'll just continue. Uh, as, 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 as a project lead, I help with the conduct of researches in the Philippines, such as um, the implementation of the research on the network analysis of actors involved in disaster risk reduction and management. And sorry, I can't move it. Uh, thank you, Sabrina. Yeah. Um, yes, that slide. Um, and I, the results of our study and learnings are shared to various stakeholders, network partners, government agencies, and community partners. We recently published the result of our study on community-based leadership and disaster resilience in partnership with the University of Santo Tomas. And as mentioned earlier by Mark, we had a symposium on the impacts of COVID-19 on marginalized sectors participated by almost 50 representatives from the academe and various sectors. Um, we also continue to develop partnership with various institutions in the Philippines. And together with my co colleagues, I continue to implement various research activities in the Philippines. Next slide, please. Sorry, there. Okay, we're back. Thank you. So when we talk of um, career, we also think of our dream job. Mine was to work in the post office. When I was nine years old, my dad was, a sen was sent to U.S. Armed Forces Culinary School. I would miss him very much, and I would regularly go to the post office to send him letters. I thought working at the post office was magical. So at nine years old, I understood how important communication was. Then I later changed my mind, and I wanted to be a doctor. I also saw the film Mulanai, which talked about the lives of young medical doctors working in far-flung villages at the time of martial law. The concept of working in isolated areas was not alien to me. Growing up, I frequently heard my mom talk about my papu, teaching in an isolated island in Sambales. Papu is my grandma, and she would bring my mom with her to teach first, third, first to third graders in a mixed class. My mom would sit her in her class and learn how to write even before formally attending school. When my mom was in college, she worked in Gallup Research. She would conduct surveys and interviews and go on field work. She talked about computers the size of an entire room where you punched card to enter data. Later on, mama spent the rest of her life working with marginalized farmers, helping them get certificates of land ownership. From her, I learned the exciting world of research and field work. So, I pursued pre-med course on food technology, which has 35 units of chemistry, um, several units of microbiology and food science. I spent the first three years of my career working in the food research and development laboratory and in food safety. But I found the environment outside me to be more exciting. So 
I pursued a graduate degree on environmental education with majority of its subjects on environmental science, marine ecology, and environmental biology. In here, I learned how to transform science concepts into bite-sized information easily understood by students, employees, and people in the communities. I published three articles on environmental ethics, environmental education, and responsible environmental behavior. I soon embarked on many other different areas in the span of 20 years of my career, covering a range of the disaster risk reduction and management continuum, food security, various environmental projects. Was I job hopping like Mark mentioned earlier? There's a lot of words in there and kind of look crazy, right? Um, let me break this into sizable categories. To categorize the areas I have worked with, I divided it into social and environmental or ecological dimensions. The slide, this slide tells about my experience in the social dimension and my contributions. The small circles tell about the chronology of my work experience. My entry to the humanitarian sector happened after the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, where I worked as a research and documentation officer at the Asian Regional Resource Center for Human Rights Education in Thailand. We worked with NGOs for capacity building of undocumented migrants in the Thai Burma border, Chiang Mai and Bangkok. We helped migrant communities and NGOs working in disaster response better understand human rights and the sphere standards. When I mentioned earlier how I worked with a range of the disaster risk reduction and management continuum, it meant my involvement in disaster recovery like after the tsunami in Thailand and value chain analysis for small farmers in Nueva Ecija where we linked farmers affected by typhoons to rural banks to access recovery package. I also engaged in disaster preparedness through developing training manuals for local government units and in developing standard operating procedures for emergency preparedness for health and nutrition security for the provinces of Laguna, Batangas, Sorsogon, and Benguet. Currently at HHI, I help implement researches and other activities to enhance community resilience. So here are the environmental or ecological projects that I had engaged with. I worked on studying the remnant sea turtle nesting population in Davao, which led to the establishment of a sea turtle research center and two publications. I also worked with UN agencies on wetlands conservation and on the ethics of climate change, where I highlighted the negative environmental impacts of meat production in three publications. I am a fan of Crawford S. Collins' multiple, multiple stability state and how stable and diverse ecosystems contribute to building resilience. And both these engagements with UN agencies were a manifestation of that belief. I also worked on promoting environmental governance and capacity building of regional directors of the, of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, as well as on promoting transparency of extractive industries like mining, oil and gas companies in the Philippines as part of the World Bank, of the World Bank project. Both social and environmental or ecological dimensions are equally important in building resilience at the national down to the community and household levels. Resilient commun communities are those that are able to learn from their disaster experience and bounce back including undocumented migrants and marginalized sectors, as well as the, as the biodiversity, which are often neglected. Healthy ecosystems are vital to support healthy communities. The connecting heart of both social and ecological dimensions are evidence-based research and capacity building, documenting projects, writing reports and publications are ways of communicating to a greater audience, translating this information to both uh, to local language and presenting back to the partner communities should be a standard approach. And building capacity of communities interconnects disaster preparedness, climate change awareness, and responsible environmental behavior. The world is in so much trouble right now, and I truly, truly believe that there are many ways many ways which all of us could contribute to. 
I believe that working or having a career in the humanitarian sector can help bridge the gap. Let us make our career an extension of our values and the many dimensions that intersect with the humanitarian sector provides multiple paths for your career. As you engage the world, you will be tested and choosing a career that is deeply rooted in your values can help keep you on course. Mentors are pivotal in career development and in having a moral compass. Developing and supporting your different networks through the many areas of your engagements can also provide synergy. Thank you for taking your time to listen. And if you have questions later on or you want to connect, just send me a message. So thank you. Thank you so much, Leia. I would also like to invite Mark back onto the webinar um, for any Q&A questions with the audience. Sure, Sabrina. Uh, I can turn my video on. As a reminder, attendees can submit questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, um, and we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Thanks, Arena. All right, so I see our first question um, that I'll pose to both of you. How did you choose your career or the universe, universe or did the universe just lead you to it? Either of you can hop in. Do you want to go, Mark, first or should I go? Sure, you go, you go first, sure. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Mark. As I mentioned earlier, I initially I wanted to take pre-med. Yeah, I wanted to I wanted to be a doctor, but um, things turn into a different path when I become more engaged into working in environment that related activities. So I really wanted to do humanitarian work from the beginning because I'm I, I heard stories from my mom and from my papu about it, and it's just what I wanted to do. So. Yeah, I'm still doing my dream job. Yeah, th thanks, Miss Leia. And for for me, uh, I actually did not expect that I would be in that I would end up in the humanitarian sector, uh, because uh, since college I was always long been wanting to be a journalist and work in the media. But uh, yeah, I have spent. Uh, several years in the media, but uh, it has come to a point that uh, I needed to take a break because uh, in reality, really media work, especially in broadcast, is very uh, demanding of your not just uh, emotional, physical, but psychological energy. So yeah, I, had, I just had to take a break. But uh, when I entered in HHI, I was surprised that uh, I am now three years with the organization and I'm very much happy with my work. And uh, like I said earlier, uh, HHI is very much flexible or gi giving uh, a lot of flexibilities for us to also do all our other passions while we work in the organizations. Great, thank you both. A lot of questions are coming in about how can someone get into humanitarian work without um, prior experience in the sector? Do you have any advice on that? In my experience, as I have mentioned earlier, there are many entry points for going into the humanitarian work. You just have to find the intersections. Like, for example, you can start to doing development work or marketing, and then later end up um, getting sponsorship, for example, to send more children to school. So in a way you start with uh, sales and then you can later on end up with um, 
working with getting donors or get, getting donations for the humanitarian sector that you want to specifically work in. So there's no, in my case, there's no straight path just for doing humanitarian work. Others focus, for example, on respond and they take a lot of uh, work experience from that. But there are other entry points that you could go into and still end up doing humanitarian work. Uh, in my in my case, uh, uh, I actually uh, uh, just saw the job job posting via Facebook. Yeah, in the Facebook, that I just saw it. That there's uh, an op an opening for a communications person at HHI. So I just uh, tried, and I. I don't have any background in the humanitarian sector. My background uh, was in media, in different media organizations. And yeah, I think for, for communications, if you're interested in doing communications, it's really a great advantage if you gain some experience in media or journalism. Yeah. Great, thank you both. Um, Leah, in your presentation, you had talked about the role of mentors. Um, can both of you talk about your mentors and how they've helped you? Is there any, you know, career advice that you receive um, that really that really helped you in your career path? Okay, the first mentor I considered was when I started working in the Asian Regional Resource Center for Human Rights Education. I didn't actually apply for that job. Uh, during that time, I was in Chiang Mai visiting a friend and then the soon-to-be boss um, had an event. Uh, they had a workshop for an NGO. And then just over the weekend, she asked me, oh, would you like to document for me just over the weekend? And I wasn't doing anything. So I, I joined them. And then after that, she offered me the job. I wasn't even looking for it. And she turned out to be my, uh, my mentor. And she has mentored a lot of us. One of us is already like a minister. Others are working in high positions in the UN agency already, different various UN agencies doing international jobs. The first thing that she taught me was, um, it's not about the money that you earn and it's about doing the, your best in any tasks assigned to you. So that, that was, um, and then you can also, so in, in my case, that's a moral mentor. It doesn't have to be also for uh, an academic mentor that would shape your career. You can have both, but just be open for um, um, your network and or be open to the possibilities and just be flexible. Uh, for, for me, uh, I think my first mentor that I truly... Uh, consider as a mentor was uh, Ms. Tina Arcedo Mlao. She's a, an, a business editor in a newspaper where I worked before. I was actually not in the business uh, desk, but I just, just one day she asked me if you would like to write or cover business features. And I, I didn't know about business at all that time. So, and I took it. And from that on, uh, yeah, it took me into many, uh, many opportunities, not just in journalism, but also in other writing opportunities. So I think uh, if you find someone in your organization that truly believes in you, even if it's not your, or even if they're not your direct supervisor, even if it's from another department, but when you think that this person believes in you, trusts you, and so will support you, like you, you uh, take that opportunity and like show what you can do and uh, be appreciative of what they are giving to you. Uh, in, at HH, I am very thankful to Enzo and our program manager, Ariana, because they are really great mentors. They are great leaders. Um, they are not just kind, but they also uh, care not just about our professional growth, but also our personal wellness, especially during the pandemic. So it's a really great uh, place to work at. And 
I think from a developing country, it's quite rare to have that kind of working environment and leaders. So I am really hoping that, uh, especially in developing countries, there will be more good leaders and a uh, better working environment. Great, thank you both. Um, Mark, you touched upon this a little bit in your in your answer about you know wellness in this line of work. What are the current challenges um, that you face while working in this field, and how do you handle the stress um, in your job? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, the pandemic has been very challenging for us, especially uh, I think mentally for all of us. Uh, so uh, before the pandemic, Ms. Leia and I have been going into field works, into local communities, and like we've been spending a lot of time dealing with people and the populations that we serve. And then when the pandemic uh, happened, we, everything shifted online. So uh, what I did was like actually to, uh, it, the pandemic gave me an opportunity to, to take care of myself more and like pursue other passions as like or like interest i like i tried baking i tried painting i tried i tried learning how to play a guitar lele so yeah just even within just uh the foreigners of your uh house you could uh yeah distress especially now that we're in quarantine so yeah, I think exploring your interest, interest and the things that you haven't done before that you that you really wanted to do is a great thing to do right now. And Leah, um, just like Ma Mark mentioned earlier, that it would be good to have uh, some activities. I became a plantita during the pandemic, but I don't even have like green farm before. <laughs> And it, it helps to regularly connect with, with the people you are close with, connect with your network, with your friends. And it, it helps that you also have different friends from different sectors. So, so you kind of have like a mix of everything. I would assume Mark also like, for example, have friends outside his journalism team. So I would encourage that to have like a, a lot of different support systems. And so you could also, learn so much from them and also at the same time be of help to them so it's it's a two-way process and just getting in touch with them during the pandemic kind of helps with uh, with with the stress associated with the job great and then a couple other questions are coming in um, regarding professional skills and background experience what kind of professional skills do you think are most crucial to have a successful career in the humanitarian sector? Um, and additionally, you know, if someone doesn't have a you know advanced degree in a specific field, um, is that really needed? I think for me, for communications, uh, if you wanted to, to pursue communications, the really essential skills that you should have are writing, uh, knows for news, you should know uh, what is newsworthy, what story is newsworthy, and how to convey uh, complex data and information to the public. Uh, and also creativity, is a little bit of creativity. Uh, and for the degree, uh, it's not necessarily needed to have a graduate degree in communications, but uh, in some companies or organizations, uh, especially I, I, I've observed in the Philippines, uh, government agencies are the ones who are uh, usually requiring a, a graduate degree if you wanted to become like a director of communications of, of their agency. But uh, in many organizations, uh, like in HHI, I think uh, more than the degree, it's the skills and the professionalism that you put on the table that mat matters more uh, at the end of the day. Yeah. I agree with Mark. It's um, having a graduate degree or a PhD is a plus, but not a requirement. 
but it's good to practice your writing skills and publish uh, so that slowly you are building your um, uh, track record in, in the field of specialization that you want. But uh, based on my experience, as I've mentioned earlier, there are many entry points. You could start working on food security or shelter if you're an engineer, for example, or an architect or um, working with children's rights. So there are many different areas or field of entries for doing humanitarian work. What matters is like what Mark mentioned earlier, um, improving your skills, your writing skills and your ability to work with different types of people. So I guess that's it. Great. So at HHI, um, one of the big missions is educating the future leaders um, in the humanitarian field. What advice and words of wisdom would you give to individuals, youth, just beginning their career in the humanitarian field? I think for me, I think the basic thing is awareness of the issues in humanitarian uh, sector, uh, especially crisis. Uh, on our part, our focus is on disasters and the climate change impacts and as well as the pandemic. So I think gaining awareness of those issues, the, the different sides of those issues and uh, learning about how aid uh, works and how uh, the populations that we serve uh, are impacted. Having that basic information would be a great foundation for you. And of course, if you can get into an organization where you can do some work related to humanitarian or development work, that would be a great stepping stone for you. As for me, I would say continue building on your skills. There are many available online classes or training or webinar that you could attend. And if you really want to learn more about the humanitarian field, you can start, for example, the uh, BBR program of Harvard, the Build Back uh, Better uh, response. Uh, and that's free. And you can just take it uh, during weekends on your free time. That way you learn more about managing complex emergency situations, what they do in the humanitarian field, who are the stakeholders and the processes involved. So that's one that you can already um, try out and search, search other, um, for example, um, websites of organizations that you know that work in the humanitarian sector. And again, find available resources that you could read or training that you could attend and build your skills from that. And if later on in life, you want to pursue like a graduate course specifically focusing on that, go, go and do it, but don't stop building your skills. In addition to what Ms. Leah said, there's also the National NGO Program on Humanitarian Leadership that's conducted uh, also online at the HHI website. You can uh, search for it. And there's a question if you get a certificate for it. Yes, you get a certificate for it and you can do it on your uh, own time. Yeah, so yeah, there are a lot of resources at HHI and at Harvard. Great, thank you both so much. Um, a lot of attendees have been noting that they're working locally, um, but they, want to go out and to do international work. Um, and so my question is, are there any major criteria to consider if you want to work in the humanitarian field internationally? And what experiences um, would you need to enter that? Or is there any other ways um, such as networking um, or things like that? Yeah, I think, if you have networks uh, internationally, that would really be a huge help, uh, especially I know that large, organic, large international organizations sometimes require someone from inside the organization to vouch for an applicant before they will hire you. That's the reality in some organizations. But also in many organizations, like in HHI and in the ones I, I'm doing freelance communications with, 
uh, I really didn't have any networks or contacts. From there, I just uh, applied uh, to the, the job posting and then I got through the process. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, for me, you have to be emotionally and psychologically psychologically prepared if you want to have a work in the humanitarian sector sometimes you have this idea that if you work in the humanitarian sector you're a hero because you get to help a lot of people but there are a lot of stress and psychological or mental health impacts that it that that's involved if you work in the humanitarian field so like what i mentioned earlier sometimes when you're like put to the test you have to go back to your core principles, to your values, if, if that's what you really want to do, because sometimes things could really be difficult. If you're deployed in an area, like in another country where you don't have a support system, it might, it might be difficult. And getting deep, understanding what it is that you really want, would sort of like give you hope to push through because being the, in the humanitarian field poses also some challenges. So you have to be really sure of yourself that that's what you want to do. And it makes you happy doing that because you don't want to be working in a field that's making you depressed all the time or making you sad or making, you, um, making life very difficult for you. So that's one. And then, Having a network that supports you matters a lot. And also before doing the job or getting the job, for example, you might want to ask the organization that uh, will be hosting you or that you're getting employed if they have uh, an in-house um, mental health and psychosocial support system for you before onboarding because sometimes they just deploy uh, um, employees in the field without training them, without telling them that these are the situations that you will be facing. And so it helps that if you, if you had prior training before deployment in the field, and even after your job, because others develop PTSD in their humanitarian work. So having support even after your deployment also matters. So it, 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 it pays to know what types of support that you will get if you go into that type of job. Great. So I see that we are coming up to the hour. I would like to um, close with one final question to both of the panelists. If you had one piece of career advice um, for those who are attending, what would it be? As I've said in my presentation, I think, uh, of course, work can be very challenging. I think there's no work that's not stressful that's not challenging so i really think that uh, you should find your passions you sh if you're really passionate about your work uh you should go for it you could you should go for something that you are truly passionate about uh and of course uh it's not all about passion because in reality you have also to gain money to live so you have to balance those out uh, see opportunities that would give you both of uh, that would satisfy your passions and also your uh, uh, basic needs in order to live uh, 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 a happy life. So yes, that's my answer. <laughs> Mine is to keep on learning. Uh, everything is just like a learning opportunity and don't stop developing your skills, learning more about the area that you would want to eventually work. So keep on learning. Great, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, I'd like to thank all of our attendees for tuning in um, and Leah and Mark for speaking to us today. And if you're interested, this, is, this event is a monthly series that we host along with a number of other humanitarian focused webinars. Please feel free to join us and look at different events um, by following us on Twitter at face at Twitter at HHI or on Facebook at Harvard Humanitarian. 
humanitarian, please check out our website, hhi.harvard.edu for any upcoming events and opportunities at HHI. Thank you so very much to everyone and we wish you a nice rest of the day.